you're a trained medical professional. Yes. We don't have one on the panel. What are we to make with uh, of the American Cancer Society, for example, telling us there's no evidence of, of uh, harmful product? Many of these organizations have conflicts of interest. Very briefly, if you can, what do you, what's your defi what do you mean by conflict of interest? One of the first things that you teach residents is that you always have to look at the funding. There's a tremendous amount of sponsored research by people who are hired to do studies to find no effect. And that's plagued this field in a number of countries. The radio frequency radiation work that we did was supported by Motorola. The relationship was really very cordial and very stress-free, but only up until we started generating data. They, these folks were very, very upset and began to talk about how are they going to handle this, what sort of spin can we put on this, what can we expect from this, and from that point on the relationship changed. What we saw was that Motorola began to exert more and more control over the work, telling us what to do, telling us how to write abstracts, what to say in the abstracts, what to say in the papers, how to do the work. No, don't do this, yes, do it this way. This was unacceptable. I had completed our study of DNA damage, and I submitted the final report to Motorola. They simply weren't willing to accept my interpretation of my study, my evaluation of my study, my knowledge of science at that point, and tried to urge me not to publish the study. Did you hear about people coming to you as far as, uh, as, far as having complaints about uh, illness? We were made aware of health complaints following installation of smart meters, and we wanted to verify this uh, using our field work. So I measured the field of about 30 different people while they stood one foot in front of the smart meter, and in every single case, the uh, human energy field was obliterated as they stood in front of the smart meter. So in our first slides, what we see is normal cells, and the structure of the cells is intact and sound. This is what we would expect from a normal sample. So after two minutes of exposure in front of the smart meter at about one foot away, we see a totally different story. Sample one, you can see a lot of degradation in the cells. The cell walls have been broken, and you see changes in the cells, which are called mycoplasma. It shows a mutation to the cell. In the second sample, we see a different type of degradation to the cell membranes. You can see a corrugation here. This is called bottle cap formation, and it's known that this occurs due to oxidation or uh, exposure to free radicals. So this third subject, uh, when we did her sample, she had to be pulled away from the meter after 45 seconds because she complained about an increasingly severe headache. And here you see a phenomenon called rouleau, where the red blood cells are stacking up, which makes it very difficult for the blood to deliver oxygen to the tissues as they would be their normal function. Every single one of these is a degradation. Every single one of these shows a trauma to the blood cells and that came from something and the only variable was the smart meter. The good news in all this is the patient and the blood can return to normal once they have been removed from the influences of these stressors. Some of the effects um, that we can look at, well, one thing is, is just our regular Wi-Fi, 2.4 gigahertz. That's in the same range as microwave ovens, which are also called radar ranges, because that is radar. 2.4 gigahertz is interesting. It's not the peak absorption rate in water for uh, microwave frequencies, 
but it's at a point where it allows full penetration because if it came in at the peak, it would prevent the insides from getting warm. So that's with basic Wi-Fi. Now when we look at 5G, 60 gigahertz, this is um, what they call active dispersal sort of weaponry, just to keep people back. It burns the skin, it doesn't penetrate, but 60 gigahertz is the frequency of oxygen molecule absorption. Since um, they have electrons that they share with each other, what we breathe is actually O2, pair of oxygen. So being bombarded with 60 gigahertz could very well impair our oxygen absorption rate in our body and thereby the whole basis of our living system. Martin Paul says, putting tens of millions of 5G antennas without a single biological test of safety has to be about the stupidest idea anyone has had in the history of the world. So assessing all this, we have experts in various fields, military EMF weaponry, biological effects on humans, firefighters that are getting cognitive impairment by being there in them, countries that are banning these sort of technologies around schools because of the impairment to cognitive. Let's weigh that up in light of what Rudolf Steiner said in 1924 about just mere radio causing the impairment of cognitive functions on people, that they can receive news from around the world, but they can't understand it as well because of the effect of the electricity. We have to say, something smells sinister here. With the fifth generation, it's actually a whole new ball game. It's not using the same technology. They use, they're switching to uh, military grade millimeter wave technology. And when you look at this technology, I mean, if you go and look at DARPA reports, come and look at some of the patents that the United States military has put out on what they can do with um, psychological weapons, all sorts of things, crowd control, active denial, anything you can think of, this is what they can do with 5G. So any type of military application you can think of which is, has an electromagnetic base, they can do with 5G. And they're putting this out blanket across the population. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Good evening, my fellow Americans. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. FCC is a capture agency. They probably conducted what I believe to be the biggest fraud on the public ever conducted. The FCC has been described by Harvard University's uh, Center for Ethics writer Norman Alster as the most captured agency in DC, acting more as a uh, industry cheerleader than a regulator. Um, this is especially true today with 5G, where there are serious safety concerns and potentially misleading information coming from the FCC. For example, the previous chairman of the FCC is Tom Wheeler. He was the head of the Wallace Lobby Association for 14 years. Now remember, Obama told us there would be no lobbyists in his administration, so he took the biggest lobby and put him as a, a head of the FCC. And that's damn important. In 1993, the FCC started a rulemaking to adopt the IEEE regulations on this issue. IEEE is an engineer association. Why is it that we adopt regulation of engineers who maybe know how to measure this radiation when it's passing a wall but not when it's passing a body? All our health agencies objected it, saying that it makes no sense to adopt engineer association that they had not even one biomedical person on their, on their team. They are effectively indemnified against adverse health impact lawsuits when the uh, acceptable limits are higher than the limits actually shown to show harmful health effects. The FCC guidelines were developed for short-term exposures, six minutes, 30 minutes, depending on it's a phone or an outdoor exposure, and they have absolutely no connection to the biological effects 
that have been very clearly summarized in the bio initiative. So as you can see, there's a number of individuals in this room today that have uh, serious concerns about this uh, as regards to their health. If uh, one of your companies decides to uh, put one of these small cells up at a pole that's within, say, 50 feet of one of their houses, what recourse do they have uh, to say, is there a way to move it somewhere else? Um, there, there's language in the bill so that the authority can require the applicant to come forth with certification of compliance with the FCC's rules related to radio frequency emission. Remember that denial of request or denial permit request that you can put in? It's going to point back to the acceptable levels as determined by the FCC. Not the EPA and not the CDC, the ones who usually take care of health concerns, but by the FCC, which is staffed by former F, um, members of the telecommunication industry. That's the fox guarding the hen house. It's a fact that most insurance companies will not indemnify against EMF effects. Telecom companies around the world are warning their investors of potential major cost due to real or alleged risks of EMF pollution from their products. Interestingly enough, they're warning their investors, but they're not telling their customers. They're basically keeping it quiet because that's where their money comes from. So we're using technology that could be very potentially harmful to us, and the investors know it, but their only worry is that they might lose money, not that our health might be affected. First of all, I think the, the, what you should really think about is why is it that they're not insured. It's not that they chose to be self-insured. They're actually rejected by the insurance company from being insured because they understand the risk. And so the insurance the companies, risk, the big insurance companies, so will not okay. insure the telecommunication? So, okay. so there's insurance companies, and then there's what's called secondary insurance companies. Secondary insurance companies are the insurance companies that insure the insurance companies. So in an event, an insurance company, let's say, uh, I insure Verizon, and it may not be able to meet the claims, then the secondary insurance company is kicking in. Like Lloyd's yeah. of London. Sorry? Like yes, Lloyd's of exactly. London. So two uh, leading one would be Lloyd's of London and Swiss Rare. Both told the insurance company not to insure the wireless industry, and this is why they're not insured. And that should give you a hint. Now, this is exactly why they have to prevent a uh, health in, uh, uh, lawsuit. And how do they prevent lawsuit? That goes back to Section 704. Section 704 was passed in 1996. This is how our rights in regards to health were taken away by the wireless industry. What this legislation did, it gave the power to regulate the health effects of wireless technology to the FCC. FCC is a spectrum auctioning agency. It's not a health agency. They don't even have one biomedical person on their team. And then the other thing that Section 704 did it actually took the power from the state to regulate location of cell towers based on health. And what does it mean? It means that if they want to put a cell tower in front of your home, you cannot go to your city council and say, hey, stop, I don't want it. I just heard in lecture that there are 10,000 studies proving that it's harmful. I don't want it. My child is sick. They would tell us, stop. You're not allowed to mention this in the city council because Section 704 says that if you will, and if the application will be rejected, the city will be sued, can be sued by the wireless industry. 